Ten years after a shooting that changed NIU forever, families, survivors, and Huskies gather to remember the losses. Ryan was the light of my life. I love that kid. We'll take a look at where we were to where we are. The city has definitely become uh, safer from that. Has our NIU community moved forward, together forward? NTC News starts now with a closer look at a week of remembrance. Thanks for joining us. We're going to take a look at what the university has done to honor the Valentine's Day victims and those who helped reshape the NIU community on this episode of NTC News Tonight. Good afternoon, I'm Brandon Giese. It's Thursday, February 15th, and I'm Jamia Green. First, a look back on that faithful day 10 years ago. There were more than 150 students on hand for a geology lecture in Cole Hall right before class was about to let out around 3 o'clock in the afternoon. A student stormed in and opened fire with a shotgun and three pistols. He killed five students and injured an additional 17 people, including a grad student teacher, before fatally shooting himself afterwards. Classes were canceled as the campus was placed on lockdown for a week to hold the victim's memorial services. The campus stood still and mourners bowed their heads as bells tolled five times at 3.06 p.m. yesterday, the exact time the shooting began. <laughs> More than 100 people gathered around the memorial to pay their respects to the victims and their families. Many people placed flowers or crosses in front of the memorial during this very emotional ceremony. Let's take a closer look now at the five victims who lost their lives that day. The victims ranged from 19 to 32 years old. 20-year-old Daniel Parmenter was from Westchester. He was a sophomore studying finance and was an advertising representative for the Northern Star. He was also a member of Pi Kappa Alpha fraternity and the NIU rugby team. Witnesses say Parmenter was shot while protecting a female classmate. Juliana Gahant was 32 years old from Mendota, Illinois. She served 12 years in the U.S. Army and Army Reserves. It was during that time she decided to pursue a career in elementary education, which she was studying at the time of her passing. Individuals close to her say she was smart, kind, and honorable. Catalina Garcia of Cicero was a 20-year-old studying education. Garcia was active with the Latino Resource Center and worked with the NIU Center of Latino and Latin American Studies. She was the youngest of four children. Gail Dabowski was a 20-year-old sophomore from Carroll Stream. Dabowski studied anthropology and was a longtime member of the Chicago Church of Christ. She also studied the Russian language and was described as a student who was strong in a variety of subject matters. Ryan Mace was from Carpentersville and was just 19 years old. Mace was an honor student studying psychology with the hopes of attaining a doctorate degree to work in the field of counseling. Mace was also a member of Delta Psi Alpha. We were able to learn more about Ryan as NTC News reporter Marlene Wences had a chance to catch, speak up, speak with her parents and find out how they keep her memory alive. Ryan Mace was the apple of her parents' eyes. She was an only child who made her parents smile all the time with her sense of humor. Dad, you got something on your face. This is what she saw. Just a little bit of ugly right there. That ah, won't come off. Ryan came to NIU as a psychology major and was a sophomore, hoping to one day be a mental health professional or a doctor. She was a sunny person, um, just had a good disposition, very friendly, very open, um, easy to get along with. They remember the day they got the phone call that changed their lives. I was sitting at my desk at work and my boss's wife called and she says, have you heard? And I said, heard what? She says, there's been a shooting at NIU. They remember the moment they knew she was gone. The second that they took us away from everybody else, I knew we weren't going to get good news. Ryan's father has since started a tradition to keep her memory alive. He takes nature pictures and posts them online. On the 14th, just take the day off and go out and find something and keep a collection of it. That way, over time, I can remember where I was, what I was doing, and um, you know, kind of have a running record of how I got through all of this. That along with the tattoo that he has reminds him that she may be gone, but she'll never be forgotten. It's called the never-ending knot. It's a Celtic knot that basically um, 
and it, it's sort of the Irish uh, symbol for infinity. It has no beginning, it has no end. I'm Marlene Wences for NTC News. Ryan's parents say they scattered her ashes around Oregon at places that she visited and wished to visit again. Strength comes from remembering. The Pig Museum of Anthropology knows that. That's why they hosted a special exhibit in honor of the tragic shooting. The Forward Together Forward exhibit featured items from the NIU archives like newspaper clippings, memorial gifts from other colleges, and photographs of student and faculty reactions on the day of the shooting. The exhibit showed the depth of the campus, community, and national support. It also displayed how NIU has rebuilt and recovered since the day of the incident. The memorial events to honor and remember the victims began as early as last Friday. Over the weekend, NIU held what they called a reflection walk on campus. NTC News reporter Jackie O'Donnell has more on that. NIU held a reflection walk to allow family members of the victims, survivors, and first responders to reflect on the tragedy. The walk was a 2.14 mile course around the recreation center. With reflection rooms. So mm -hmm. they have information about the event, it has information about those we lost. It provides us a, a space to rest, to reflect, and also to write some reflections if people choose to leave those behind. Each reflection room focused on a different student who was taken, as well as a place to sit and rest during the event. This event is different from other events happening on campus. Um, we were trying to do something that it was a little bit more informal, that allowed people to uh, reflect on the event, and usually movement is a good way. The walk also encompassed the idea of Forward Together Forward that helped the community come together after the shooting and can still be seen throughout the campus still today. We have, a, we have this sense of resiliency and hope that certainly comes from a really difficult time and that has become part of the campus, the fabric mm -hmm. of the campus community. The university will continue to move forward together one step at a time during this anniversary of the shooting. From NTC News, I'm Jackie O'Donnell. A look now at the man who was responsible for the attack. 27-year-old Steven Kazmierczak graduated from NIU in 2006 with a degree in sociology. He continued his education at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign as a graduate student. Prior to attending NIU, Kazmierczak was treated temporarily for an undisclosed mental illness at a psychiatric center. His girlfriend at the time confirmed that Kazmierczak stopped taking his prescribed medication in the weeks leading up to the attack. No motive for the shooting was ever established. The shooter's face is one that one particular individual will never forget. Marlene Winces sits down with the shooting survivor as he shares his story. Marlene? Joining us today is Patrick Corrales, one of the survivors of the shooting. Thank you for being with us today, Patrick. Of course. What do you remember about the day of the shooting, moments before it occurred? Uh, there are 15 minutes left of class um, and all of a sudden the door was kicked open on the stage and a guy walks in with a long trench coat doesn't say a word pulls out his shotgun and just starts shooting at us after the third or fourth shot I realized this is real um, a lot of us were screaming crying uh, I got under my desk I waited there someone in the classroom shouted he's reloading as soon as that happened I started getting up crawling towards the door and I got up and that's when I felt something hit me in the back of the head what were the first thoughts that ran through your head as you realized that you were hurt? I, I thought that I was going to die. I didn't know anything about guns at the time. I thought I had a bullet lodged in my brain, in my head. I got dizzy. I had blood all over my head, my arm. I was very scared. What does Valentine's Day mean to you now? How has your life changed after the shooting? Yeah, Valentine's Day has been so different now. You know, every year on Valentine's Day, I think about this day, think about what happened ten years ago and you know I just think of a moment to reflect about my classmates um, my five classmates that were killed and you know I just try to move forward what do you feel as you step back into NIU back onto this campus um, I'm I feel happy being back on campus um, I come back on occasion for career day and things like that but especially on this day I feel happy to be with my classmates, be with those around me that went through the same thing that I did. The families are happy to see us, to see the children that were with their children when they passed away. 
How has NIU showed support to you? NIU has showed wonderful support. Uh, every year they do some sort of event, the five year, the 10 year, or larger <laughs> events. Um, they always reach out to us, making sure we're okay. They have events for us outside of the anniversaries, such as going to the movies or dinners. The university's been wonderful. Thank you very much for being with us today, Patrick. Of course. Back to the desk. Coming up next, how lighting a candle is helping shooting survivors find their way to recovery. We'll explain. And has campus security changed since the shooting? We'll take a look. NTC News will be right back. What's Beethoven's favorite fruit? Banana. -na. <laughs> about the scarecrow who won an award? He was outstanding in his field. <laughs> hey you. Yeah you, getting that college education. What are you gonna do? Graduate and take some office job? Be like everybody else. Or will you dare do something different? Like be a teacher. You could be my teacher. You got the skills. The smarts. Yes, you. You could be the teacher I never forget. That would be cool. Does that corporate job even have recess? What are you going to make of yourself? What are you going to make of me? the things you've done with your bike, donating it to Goodwill may be the most incredible of all. Your donations help fund job placement and training for people in your community, which means your stuff can be more powerful than you think. Goodwill. Donate stuff, create jobs. What to expect when you're expecting a teenager. Today we're talking about how to wake up your teen, and this works literally every time. Good kisses. You heard how loud I, no, I heard. I heard. It wasn't you. It was the. Is that bacon? You don't have to know it all to be a perfect parent. Thousands okay. of teens in foster care will love you just the same. We're back with more on this NTC special on the 10th anniversary of the NIU shooting. The university held a candlelight vigil on Friday to com commemorate the lives that were lost. NTC reporter Martin Sotelo attended that event and has more on the story. NIU started the week of remembrance with a candlelight vigil to reflect, heal, and continue to move forward together. Members of the Student Association began the ceremony with special candles that represented each victim of the shooting. Former NIU President John Peters had an interactive relationship with students and conveyed one message to them. All I could say was keep faith and be strong and, and love each other and take care of each other. Peters also noticed a widespread community movement following the tragedy. While it was extremely painful, you could feel that the, the campus was coming together. While those in attendance looked back on dark times, the flames in the room only got brighter. Dean of Students Kelly Wessner Michael has seen the flames strengthen over the past decade. In 10 years, but through, the, through those 10 years, we've not only become stronger, but we are a community of resiliency, and that's to be celebrated. And while the candle flames were put out that evening, the community's flames continues to spread into all of those affected. And the Cal firefighter Patrick Erickson has no intention of putting this fire out. You've got a community that will always support you. You've got a university that will always support you. You've got a police department and a fire department that will always support you and be there for you. This fire doesn't just burn on top of a candle, but in everyone's heart. From NCC News, I'm Martin Sotelo. The next day, there was also a concert featuring students from the music department performing in honor of the victims. A remembrance breakfast was held yesterday at the Kishwaukee Hospital to honor first responders. Hospital staff, police officers, and families of the victims reflected on the past 10 years and the day they brought them all together. Emergency room director Cindy Graves was there in 2008 and she says she is amazed at how the hospital workers responded. 
seeing my staff go into into uh, into action and um, being able to take care of those kids and the compassion that was shown uh, both to the, the victims and to the families as they started coming in was really something to be seen. This was the first time that the hospital has held this particular event. NIU President Lisa Freeman also spoke at the event. Many first responders have a lot of stories to share from that day, where they were and what they heard. But Sergeant Larry Ellington was one of the very first officers on the scene at Cole Hall, and he says it is the day he'll never forget. He's with Brandon to share more about his experience. Brandon? Thanks, Jamia. So we previously spoke, actually, and you mentioned an ironic story. Can you run me through that in the moments up to you receive the call? We had one of our uh, emergency management personnel individuals uh, meeting with faculty staff about different things and the way that people need to respond in emergency situations such as like tornadoes or anything of that nature and more towards the end of the conversation uh, he brought up active shooters and there was an individual and again I wasn't there so I don't know the exact words but there's an individual who suggested that maybe stick to something a little more practical reasonable more likely to happen within about a minute a radio call came out that there was a shooting at Cole Hall so it was a very ironic situation that took place and he immediately left and started to respond to the scene so it's one of those things to where uh, you, you never know when it's gonna happen so you were the first responder at that scene can what did you witness can you run us through some of the emotions that you might have had and what the scene was like yeah, well I was a first responder at the scene there's a lot of people converging on the building uh, at the same time that I was uh, I did happen to get there the fastest but that's just a coincidence so we had a lot of people going towards the scene I was part of uh, four other uh, individuals five of us total that made it into the building and it was a it was obviously a, a hectic journey over to the building just running towards there just knowing that you know, essentially someone's killing kids and I've got to stop them so that's about all I was thinking about once I got to the building started clearing it I was in there for a short period of time uh, before I turned a corner and ran into four other individuals from the police department uh, we linked up very briefly, came up with a very quick game plan on how to deal with the very last room, which was the room where the individual was in, all the students were in. Made the plan, and then it was just go. So four of us went into the room. And we also talked about communication pretty in depth. You said that it, you had to communicate with a lot of different departments on that day. How was that? And that's probably the more interesting side of things than anything else. I mean, for the five of us to run to the building, drive to the building, and get in and clear it, that's one thing. So you're looking at five, six minutes. In my opinion, that's when the work starts uh, because it is that communication effort between all local agencies. So you've got 21 law enforcement agencies converging on campus from all over the state, and then you've got 18 police, or, uh, fire and medical personnel agencies converging from all over campus so that's where the world work begins so we were real fortunate that we had uh, two individuals in the dispatch center Joe Prisbell and Sam Denton that uh, coordinated that entire effort uh, w without them doing the job that they did things would have looked very differently because we responded but then the work really begins and that's where they came in and coordinated that many people that many agencies all converging on campus at the same time for the response Wow that must have been a, a hectic situation how has security since that changed at NIU it has not changed dramatically. Uh, we are already in a pretty good spot to begin with. So there was no need to reinvent the wheel, so to speak. Uh, a lot of the security arrangements remain in place. Uh, our training continues, the training of not just the internal personnel within the police department, but also within the campus community. So things like the ALICE program, which is designed to teach faculty, staff, students how to uh, respond in a situation like that. Uh, we've incorporated a lot of that into what it is that we're doing. All right, well, it's been a pleasure. Back to you guys at the desk. Thanks, Brandon. And the DeKalb Police Department says they are working with NIU police to try and make sure a tragedy like this never happens again. Since the shooting, a police commander says the biggest change is the technology. He says they've installed more security cameras and have also formed a special operations team. And as we just heard, the ALICE program is a system that will alert special operations team if someone calls during a tragedy. Have those security measures made any difference to the students who are on campus day in and day out? We took to the streets to ask NIU students if they feel safer after the shootings. Here's what they had to say. Campus, they do a pretty good job. I mean, there's always room for improvement. No system's perfect, but I like the Husky Safe line and stuff like that. Systems like, you know, you need your one car to get into everywhere. I mean, I feel safe in that aspect, but 
It's just really uncontrollable. The city continues to pass on the legacy of the students who passed after the shooting. Every year, five undergraduate students are awarded a $4,000 scholarship as a part of the Forward Together Forward tradition. The fund was created after more than 1,700 people donated to honor the students we lost. This year's winners includes Speaker of the Student Association, Christine Wang. Wang initiated the commencements at the Candlelight Vigil on Friday. Coming up, coming up next on NC News, we'll have a look at what is making news nationally. A Florida high school shooting leaves a community in shock. We'll have the latest on investigation. And a Chicago police officer is laid to rest. We'll have more on that story. NTC News will be back in a moment. What to expect when you're expecting. Like here? A teenager. Today, I'm going to show you how to team-proof your home. First step, hide the car keys. Preferably somewhere they would never look. Challenges will come up. Be ready for them. Hi, honey. Ready for the Mom, you don't use mannequins in the mannequin challenge. You don't have to know it all to be a perfect parent. Thousands of teens in foster care will love you just the same. <laughs> In national news, a suspect is in custody after a high school shooting in Florida that took the lives of 17 students. 19-year-old Nicholas Cruz was a former student of the Parkland, Florida High School before he was expelled. Cruz entered the school just after 3 p.m., set off the fire alarm, and started shooting students as they evacuated the building. He was caught in the neighboring community of Coral Springs as he tried to escape. Flags will be at half-staff today after a police a Chicago police commander was killed in the line of duty. 53-year-old Paul Bauer was shot on Tuesday at the Thompson Center while trying to apprehend a suspect. The 31-year veteran of the police department leaves behind his wife and daughter. The wake is scheduled for tomorrow and his funeral will be on Saturday. The suspect in the shooting was a career criminal who police say has been in and out of prison since 1999. In political news, an unlikely incident takes place outside of the NSA headquarters. And House Speaker Paul Ryan pushes the government to rework its vetting system. Carl Reavy has more on this in this week's Political Pit Stop. Thanks, guys. Investigators are looking into an incident outside of the NSA headquarters in Maryland that left several people injured and hospitalized. Police say gunshots were fired as a vehicle attempted to enter the agency's campus yesterday before crashing into concrete barriers. The driver, an NSA police officer, and a civilian onlooker were all hospitalized. The White House says they believe the incident is not terror-related. House Speaker Paul Ryan claims that the government's vetting system needs to be reworked in response to outrage surrounding former White House Staff Secretary Rob Porter. Porter was accused of domestic abuse by two ex-wives, and the FBI director claims that the Bureau made White House officials aware of the allegations throughout 2017. When asked about President Trump's failure to comment on these allegations, Ryan said, Clearly we should all be condemning domestic violence. These allegations were first made public last week. President Trump's personal lawyer claims he paid $130,000 out of his own pocket to a porn star before the election. The Washington Post is reporting that the private transaction was made in 2016 to Stephanie Clifford, also known as Stormy Daniels, who was alleged to have been involved in sexual relations with the president. The attorney has been accused of trying to cover up the alleged affair unlawfully. In response, the attorney says he wasn't reimbursed for the money and that neither the Trump administration nor his campaign had any part in the transaction. 
The House Intelligence Committee's top Democrat, Adam Schiff, claims he is working to minimize the number of redactions to a rebuttal to the controversial Republican memo. The President released the memo nearly two weeks ago, drafted by Republican Devin Nunes. It alleged that the FBI abused its surveillance authority at the DNC's request before the election. The Democrats compiled their own memo in response, which the President has not yet released. Schiff says the FBI redacted everything that hasn't already been made public, and he is now working with them to help them decide which of the redactions were actually needed. That's it for this week's Political Pit Stop. Let's send it back to the desk. Time now for sports. Jackie O'Donnell fizzle, fills us in with what happened this week in the world of Husky sports. Thanks, guys. It's been a busy sports week. Let's, take, let's start with a look at baseball. The NIU baseball team heads to Conway, Arkansas for a three-game series against the Central Arkansas Bears to kick off the season. The Huskies will host four Mid-American Conference Series and welcome six non-conference opponents at home. They will face UW-Milwaukee, UIC, Indiana State, and Valparaiso. The season will begin with 19 games on the road in non-conference play. NIU softball team started their season with the worst record since 2010. The Husky season began Friday with a 0-5 losing streak at the Florida Atlantic Tournament. The Huskies started the tournament with two losses against both Ohio State and Boston University. Unfortunately, the losing streak continued for the Huskies on Saturday with two losses against two Power 5 teams. NIU softball coach believes this is an important learning season for the Huskies. The women's basketball team will play Ball State University Saturday before the men's game at the Convocation Center. The Huskies are looking to extend their three-game winning streak after defeating Bowling Green Saturday. Junior forward Courtney Woods is the leading MAC scorer, averaging almost 22 points per game. She was recently named MAC West Player of the Week Monday for the fourth time this season. Ball State comes in second in the MAC with a 20-4 record. The game begins at 1 p.m. Following the women's game, the men's basketball team will take on Western Michigan Broncos. The Huskies recently fell in a back and forth battle with the Central Michigan Chippewas 72 to 80, moving their record to 11 and 15. NIU was defeated by the Broncos in their last meeting on January 27th, 72 to 79. The Huskies are looking to get a home win in the Cram the Convo event this Saturday at 3.30 p.m. That'll be it for NTC Sports, and as always, go Huskies. Let's send it back to the desk. Thanks, Jackie. Time now for a quick look at the weather. Caitlin, can we expect cooler temperatures this weekend? Well, I can tell you that the weather this weekend is fluctuating like crazy, which only tells us one thing, and that that is spring weather is right around the corner. As far as today, it has been cloudy and foggy with a high around 40. You can expect that fog to be clearing as the day goes on. However, there is a 20% chance of rain for tonight. Tonight's low will be right around 20 degrees with, with light winds between 5 and 10 miles an hour. Going into tomorrow, it will, be, it will start off cloudy, becoming clear and sunny in the afternoon. Tomorrow's high will be around, will be around uh, four, uh, 23 degrees with a low of uh, 5 degrees and moderate winds between 10 and 15 miles an hour. Taking a look into Saturday, you can um, expect it to be partly cloudy, going into cloudy, giving us a 50% chance of snow showers in the early afternoon. The high for Saturday will be right around 34 degrees and a low of right around 18 degrees with moderate winds between 15 and 25 miles an hour. That snow, those snow showers will end off by those late evening hours, so no worries there with your commute home. Taking a look at Sunday, you can expect the weekend to end off starting sunny. However, those clouds will move in, giving us a 50% chance of, of um, rain showers for the afternoon. Sunday's high will be right around 40 degrees with a low of around 35 degrees and those moderate winds once again between 15 and 20 miles an hour. Taking a look at the week ahead, there is a warm front coming, uh, warm front passing through between Friday and Saturday, so you can expect warmer temperatures and possible thunderstorms on Monday. However, those temps will drop again by Tuesday, which could bring a rain-snow mix for us. But by Wednesday, those temps will be back on, in the upper 20s and lower 30s. That's all for the weather. Now sending it back to the desk. That's all for NTC News. 
Tune in to our daily updates every Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday at 1 p.m. and our live show Thursday at 2 p.m. I'm Jamia Green. And I'm Brandon Giese. Thanks for watching and have a great day.